Hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to the Australian Institute of International Affairs. My name is Bryce Wakefield, and I am the Institute's National Executive Director. <coughs> Since ASEAN was founded in 1967, the efficacy of the institute, uh, institution has often uh, been in question. Now in an era of uh, US-China rivalry, or US-China competition, can ASEAN as an institution be effective? To discuss the strengths and weaknesses of ASEAN, we have somebody who has written volumes on the subject and talked for hours on the subject. Uh, Bilahari Kausikan, welcome. Thank you very much for being with us today. Well, oh, thank you, Bryce, for inviting me. Okay. Uh, Bilahari Kausikan is the chair of the Middle East Institute at the National University of Singapore. He's had a 37-year career with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Singapore. He was the ambassador to the Russian Federation permanent representative to the United Nations in New York, and of course, permanent secretary to the ministry. He was educated at the Raffles Institution, University of Singapore and Columbia University. And I just want to take this uh, opportunity to um, draw your attention to a magnificent series of lectures that uh, he gave at the National University of Singapore. I'll link to it here if you're watching the YouTube uh, edition of this clip. It really is an amazing uh, tour de force, tour d'horizon of, um, of not only Singaporean foreign policy, but uh, the structure of uh, world politics, the role of small states, and also uh, the role of uh, institutions like ASEAN. But for now, uh, Bilahari is going to talk on the topic of can or will ASEAN survive until 2030? And I'll pass the floor over to him. Thank you very much. Okay, Bryce, thank you. Thank you again for inviting me to talk to you today. I just hope that having heard me, you will not conclude it was an act of reckless folly. Well, will ASEAN survive until 2030? The question is, of course, rhetorical, but not entirely so. Coming after several failed experiments in regionalism, ASEAN's formation in 1967 was greeted with polite skepticism. And ASEAN continued to be regarded with skepticism by most countries during the 1970s. It was only during the 1980s that ASEAN began to be taken seriously when its handling of the Cambodian issue showed what it could do. ASEAN is now 53 years old, yet although all dialogue partners now pay ritual obeisance to ASEAN centrality, ASEAN's relevance, as you mentioned, is still regularly questioned. And the repetitive nature of the criticisms and the prescriptions that flow from them suggest that after more than half a century, the organization is still fundamentally misunderstood. Whether this is due to ASEAN's inability to call things by their proper name, which I assure you is not mere perversity on our part, or a stubborn refusal by others to accept ASEAN on its own terms, I will not venture to guess. Of course, not all the skepticism about ASEAN is undeserved. But as I have previously observed, it is utterly pointless to criticize a cow for being an imperfect horse. If ASEAN is to be criticized, it should be for the right reasons. Now let me try to explain what ASEAN is about. A recent special report entitled Built for Trust, Not for Conflict, ASEAN Faces the Future, which was prepared for the US Institute for Peace, is a convenient point of departure. It is a typical example of the genre of ASEAN criticism in that the authors mean well, but their understanding of Southeast Asia is ahistorical. Consequently, their understanding of ASEAN is flawed and some of their recommendations, if adopted, would certainly reduce the odds of our surviving until 2030. Our enemies we can deal with, but God preserve us from our friends. To avoid misrepresenting the argument, let me use the author's own summary. There are five points. First, ASEAN was de designed as a trust-building mechanism for its members rather than as a platform for mediating disputes. Historically, ASEAN has been able to minimize interstate conflict because of an adherence to the principles of consensus, non-interference, and the peaceful resolution of disputes. Its many meetings and informal social gatherings built interpersonal trust, 
enabling many disputes to be settled without resort to formal legal mechanisms. This emphasis, however, presents it, prevents it from effectively intervening in intrastate conflicts considered domestic issues, nor is it equipped to handle interstate disagreements that cannot be solved on the sidelines of meetings. Pressure on ASEAN to perform its structure and culture to reform its structure and culture comes from the changing security dynamic and the influence of external actors in the region, particularly China and the United States. One of the most pressing issues for consideration is the continued reference, uh, relevance and feasibility of ASEAN's principle of consensus decision-making in the light of emerging challenges presented by increasing US-China competition. This is a pretty standard line of argument, as I said, criticizing a cow for being an imperfect horse. But ASEAN was not, not designed as a trust building mechanism. It is true that ASEAN's fundamental purpose is to manage relations between its members. ASEAN projects are as important as means to this fundamental end as they are important in themselves. But ASEAN manages relations not so much by building trust, but by managing mistrust. And this is not the same thing. If the first premise is wrong, all that follows cannot but be error. ASEAN emerged from the ferment of post-World War II Southeast Asia and the tangled processes of decolonization and nation building in the context of the Cold War. The immediate question was how to deal with an Indonesia that had just ended Konfrontasi in mid-1966. Konfrontasi was an undeclared war that Indonesia waged against Malaysia and after we separated Malaysia and Singapore between 1963 and 1966. The broader question was how to avoid getting drawn into the proxy conflicts raging on the mainland of Southeast Asia. The causes of Konfrontasi lay in Indonesian domestic politics. But as the distinguished scholar of Southeast Asia, the late George McTurnan Cahan wrote in 1964, when Konfrontasi was still ongoing, the, and I quote, the most fundamental reason is the powerful self-righteous trust of Indonesian nationalism. Professor Kain went on to explain that, and I quote again, among Indonesians, there has developed a widely held belief that because of the country's size and armed power, and because it won its independence through revolution, it has a moral right to leadership in Asia, end of quote. Well, what ought to be obvious, but nevertheless needs to be emphasized, is that Indonesia's size and its consequent presumption of leadership is a permanent condition. Indonesia is bigger than all the other ASEAN members combined. Indonesia has not become smaller, it is now stronger. But what Kehin described 56 years ago is still an accurate description of Indonesian attitudes, albeit now more discreetly manifested and with less emphasis on its revolutionary origins. Southeast Asia's most salient characteristic is its diversity. Diversity based on primordial identities defined by race and religion. Their influence was manifest in many of the events leading up to ASEAN's formation. It was explicit in one earlier attempt at regionalism, Mafalindo, which was explicitly based on race. And during the paroxysm of bloodletting that followed the abortive 1965 Gestapo coup in Indonesia, which had a distinct anti-Chinese dimension both internally and in Indonesia's relations with China. Now, primordial identities based on race and religion are also permanent factors. In principle, one could change one's religion, but because in Southeast Asia, race and religion are closely correlated, this is more a theoretical rather than a practical proposition. Race and religion are still fundamental driving forces in the politics and international relations of Southeast Asia. ASEAN kept the peace, in Southeast Asia by easing the innate suspicions, the complications and innate tensions that are attendant upon these permanent conditions. But ASEAN did not and cannot erase them. Permanent conditions are permanent. Like chronic diseases, they can be ameliorated and managed, but they will never go away. Time and the accumulated experience of working together has built more mutual confidence and blunted the sharper edges of these factors but they are still there, lurking beneath ASEAN's surface civilities and not so deeply buried as to prevent them from still occasionally surfacing in new forms.
We live in an age when identity politics is asserting itself globally. As, what's, as, one, as what one scholar has called, the rising politics of indigeneity in Southeast Asia becomes more prominent, as I think it will. The risk of these primordial factors resurfacing can only rise. Decision making by consensus and its corollary non interference in, international, in internal affairs is the only practical means of managing these permanent conditions. These principles have sometimes been modified in practice, but they cannot be abandoned as operating principles. Consensus decision making reassures the small that the big cannot impose its will upon them. It reassures the big that the small will not gang up against it. Any other means of taking decisions will only accentuate innate suspicions and risk even small disagreements escalating into major conflicts. Now to state the point in a different way, on issues that cannot be avoided, ASEAN's fundamental consensus is to always have a consensus, even if it is only a consensus of form, not substance. ASEAN avoids discussing issues where it is obvious that there, shall, there will be no consensus. And this is why ASEAN's characteristic mode of expression is highly, shall we say, circumlocutory, sometimes to the point of obscurity or even meaninglessness. And also why ASEAN does not try to solve or even have a position on every issue. Or to restate the point in yet another way, the fundamental consensus is always to preserve the organization. The failure of the Phnom Penh ASEAN ministerial meeting in July 2012 to agree on a joint communique because Cambodia refused to accept any compromise on language on the South China Sea was therefore shocking and could have posed an existential crisis to ASEAN. Fortunately, that proved to be an exceptional situation when the Cambodian foreign minister was in a more than usually obtuse frame of mind and was thoughtlessly egged on by an overly ambitious Chinese vice minister who perhaps harbored dreams of replacing Yang Jiechi as foreign minister. In any case, the near-death experience seems to have quickly instilled a modicum of common sense both in China and its lackeys. China is not out to destroy ASEAN, only capture it. Only a week after the Phnom Penh meeting, due to the tireless efforts of the then Indonesian foreign minister, Mati Nata Legawa, consensus was reached on six principles on the South China Sea. The language of the six principles was largely taken from previously agreed documents and in parts was in fact stronger than some of the compromises Cambodia had been offered but had rejected, which underscored how Cambodia's attempt to be helpful to China had been singularly clumsy, if not downright stupid. Since then, the six principles have formed the core of consensus on the South China Sea. Cambodia and Laos has on occasion been difficult over the South China Sea, but so far at least not as foolishly intransigent as in 2012. Speaking about a year after the debacle in Phnom Penh, Khun Sen said supporting China was Cambodia's political choice. This betrayed Cambodia's lack of understanding of how ASEAN works. We are an interstate and not supranational organization. No member is required to give up its sovereign right to define its national interests as it chooses. Cambodia's right to make its own political choices was never at issue. But as Mr. S. Rajaratnam, the late Mr. S. Rajaratnam, Singapore's first foreign minister, put it at the signing of the Bangkok Declaration in 1967, henceforth we have to adopt a new way of thinking in which the regional interest had to be some part of each member's definition of national interest. The other foreign ministers made much the same point in their own ways. ASEAN's original members had differences of interest that were in some cases more fundamental than Cambodia's support for China. Among them was the Philippines' claim to Sabah, which led Malaysia to boycott some early ASEAN meetings. The role of foreign bases in Southeast Asia, which almost led Singapore to walk out of the foreign minister's meeting drafting the Bangkok Declaration. And at the end of the 1980s, during the end game in Cambodia, when Indonesia again tried to impose its will as regional hegemon. But the sense that the regional interests had to be part 
of the natural, national interest held ASEAN together and compromises were found. Now that sense is undoubtedly less strong in some of the newer members, particularly Cambodia, whose tragic and traumatic history is perhaps responsible for its um, overly transactional, narrow and short-term calculations of interest. It was a mistake for ASEAN to have hastily expanded its membership in the 1990s without adequate socialization of new members. Somewhere buried in the archives of the Singapore Foreign Ministry is a long cable sent from me, by me in 1995, I think from Moscow, saying that it, we should not hastily expand ASEAN, maybe just take Vietnam first. But anyway, that's water under the bridge and all is not lost. The most powerful and enduring type of socialization comes from the pressure of events. Whatever the suspicions and animosities the original five members harbored against each other, they were all anti-communist and faced armed communist insurgencies supported by China. With war raging on the mainland, it was to minimize the opportunity for external interventions taking advantage of intra-regional conflicts to embroil ASEAN in Cold War proxy conflicts that provided the original impetus to manage distrust. But the extension of that impetus to the idea that peace and stability could be best secured by excluding the major powers from the region, which found expression in Zotfan and later Sean Fis, the Southeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone, was impractical to the point of being delusional. Being occasionally delusional is the unfortunate price of having a consensus on always having a consensus. We don't really expect others to take these occasional flights of fancy seriously, but regrettably, and not to ASEAN's credit, they sometimes do. Zofan's main champions were Malaysia and Indonesia. Around the same time as Zofan was proclaimed, the US 7th Fleet and the Soviet Union's Pacific Fleet administered a strong dose of cold reality when ignoring the claims of these two countries that the Straits of Malacca was not an international waterway, they sent their warships through the Straits. Jakarta and Kuala Lumpur could only watch helplessly. Nevertheless, the sentiment behind Zotfan lingered on. In 1990, after a combination of Filipino politics and natural disaster, some people will say that's really the same thing, Anyway, after a combination of Filipino politics and natural disaster forced the U.S. out of Subic Bay and Club Air Base, Singapore and the U.S. signed a memorandum of understanding that allowed the U.S. limited use of some of our facilities. Jakarta and Kuala Lumpur reacted as if we had conspired with the devil to sell their firstborn into slavery. But in 2005, when an enhanced MOU was concluded, their reaction was muted. And in 2019, when an even more enhanced renewal was signed by Prime Minister Lee Sen Lung and President Trump during the United Nations General Assembly in New York, with all the fanfare that accompanies any, any Trump event, it attracted nary a whisper. Malaysia and Indonesia have built their own defense ties with the Seventh Fleet, which includes port calls, use of facilities, and joint exercises. What happened? Well, Although they may not be prepared to publicly say so, China's increasing assertiveness, if not outright aggressiveness, in the South China Sea and on other issues had brought home to them the idea that brought home to them the fact that the idea that only balance among major powers rather than their self-restraint could ensure stability in Southeast Asia was not just a Singaporean eccentricity. It also underscored the irreplaceable role of the US in any balance. The formation of the ARF, the ASEAN Regional Forum, followed by the East Asia Summit and the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus, marked a significant, if unannounced, shift in ASEAN's, ASEAN's official regional security concept. They all encouraged and entrenched the natural multipolarity of a strategic crossroads where the interests of several major powers inevitably intersect and compete. There will always be more than one major power with interest in Southeast Asia. And that is why Southeast Asia has never fallen under the sway of any single external power. Never, except for a short and historically exceptional period of Japanese occupation. The region's multipolarity is not symmetrical. 
The US and China are in a league of their own. But nevertheless, multipolarity, even if asymmetrical, maximizes maneuver space for ASEAN members. The ASEAN-led forums are coherent enough to be supplementary means for the major powers to promote their interests in Southeast Asia and thereby anchor them to the region and to ASEAN, but not so strong as to be able to stymie anything vital to them. And that is precisely why they find ASEAN useful. And this is the real meaning of ASEAN centrality. Now, it was the pressure of events and not the persuasive powers of the Singapore and other diplomats that had reservations about Zopan that caused Malaysia and Indonesia to reorder their priorities and quietly drop Zopan in favor of balance. A similar dynamic may be beginning on the mainland, where the dams that China is building, has built and is building on the upper reaches of the Mekong pose potentially existential issues to downriver riparian countries, particularly the less developed riparian countries like Laos and Cambodia. Hun Sen has called China Cambodia's most trustworthy friend. Well, not every Cambodian would agree, and certainly not when it comes to an existential issue. The leaders of Cambodia and Laos may not care very much about what happens in the South China Sea, but they must care about what happens to a river on which the livelihood, indeed the survival of a large part of their populations depend. If they are indifferent, their peoples will eventually force them to care. Cambodia has already suspended two dam projects due to domestic opposition. The utility of making the regional interests some part of their natural interests will eventually sink home. The strategic instinct of Southeast Asia that has lived in the midst of great power competition for centuries is not to align with any major power across all domains. The Southeast Asian diplomatic instinct is to hedge, balance, and bandwagon simultaneously not allowing a tactic it may adopt on one issue, say bandwagoning, to dictate its approach to another issue or in a different domain, where it may hedge or balance. Consistency is not necessarily a virtue. I once asked a senior Vietnamese official what a change of leadership in Hanoi meant for relations with China. Every Vietnamese leader, he replied, must get along with China and must stand up to China. And if you cannot do both at the same time, you don't deserve to be leader. In different degrees and in different ways, every ASEAN member has much the same attitude towards China and the US. US-China competition is not a new Cold War. This is an intellectually lazy trope which downplays the complexity of a relationship in which deep mistrust coexists with interdependence of a type and depth never before seen in strategic rivals and certainly did not exist between the US and the Soviet Union. The US and China are entangled in supply chains of, of intricacy and scope never before existed, that never before existed in the world economy. This makes it improbable that they will be able to decouple across all domains, although selective decoupling in certain fields has already begun. Coping with this will not be easy, but the very complexity and ambivalence of US-China relations, indeed all post-Cold War major power relationships, provides ample scope for the exercise of the Southeast Asian instinct not to structure strategic alignments consistently across the entire gamut of issues or on the basis of only one dimension of its relationships with any major power. And this is what we mean when we say we do not want to take sides. We will sometimes tilt one way and sometimes tilt another way, or go our own way as our own interests dictate. There is an assumption prevalent in many Western countries, particularly the US, that we in Southeast Asia are also irredeemably corrupt or so terminally naive as to cynically sell our national interests to China or cheerfully ignore them in our relationships with China. Of course, we do not shun Chinese trade and investment. Why should we? But I would like to assure you my dear audience, that while we may look stupid, not all of us are really stupid, so please tell your American friends. China is already facing pushback even from countries highly dependent on its trade and investment and who participate in China's signature Belt and Road projects. Southeast Asian attitudes towards China are complex and fraught with ambivalence. 
So too are Southeast Asian attitudes towards the US, complex and ambivalent. The US and China are both acknowledged as important, neither for different reasons is particularly trusted. As a contiguous big country, China is always going to enjoy significant influence in Southeast Asia. But for precisely the same reasons, China is also, also always going to evoke anxieties, which Beijing has done little to assuage and under Xi Jinping has been, have been enhanced. Countries on China's periphery will therefore not allow themselves to be totally hemmed in, no matter how dependent they are on any great power, and not on China. Significant influence is not exclusive or dominant influence. The natural multipolarity of the region maximizes room for maneuver and the exercise of agency. Of course, whether we have the wit to recognize the opportunities for maneuver and the agility and courage to use our agency are different matters. ASEAN's trajectory has not been and will never be continual progress along a straight line. We will always move forward with pauses and by meanderings. But of late, there have been signs that ASEAN's strategic horizons are narrowing, signs that some members prefer to rest on past laurels rather than break new ground, and even of what the unkind may call timidity creeping into ASEAN decision-making. This is not because a new generation of officials and political leaders dealing with ASEAN have inferior intellects or queasier stomachs than their predecessors. The causes are structural and have to do with the evolution of domestic politics in key ASEAN states. From the 1960s to the 1980s and even up to the early 1990s, all the ASEAN members were authoritarian states of some degree. This was when ASEAN was able to take many seminal decisions, not the least of which was to form ASEAN in the first place. The hard, if politically incorrect fact is that authoritarian systems are better at doing certain things, at pursuing long-term goals and taking tough decisions without giving public opinion too much consideration. It is now more difficult for the pluralistic political system that have evolved in several ASEAN members since the late 1990s to establish and sustain domestic consensus. Too often leaders follow rather than shape public opinion. Without nat national consensus, it is all the more difficult to reach meaningful ASEAN consensus on many issues. Some of the recommendations in the US Institute for Peace report are referred to seem oblivious of this reality and could make an already complicated situation even more complicated than absolutely necessary. And I would say the same thing about other criticisms of ASEAN. Now, please don't misunderstand. I am not arguing for ASEAN members to return to authoritarianism. That is clearly impossible and undesirable on other grounds. It is only a gentle reminder to those with a penchant for looking at political developments in Southeast Asia in simplistic terms as the advance or retreat of democracy to be careful about what you wish for and that few things are either wholly good or wholly bad. Indonesia is key. The reason why ASEAN survived while other attempts at regional organization fail essentially amounts to the difference between President Suharto and President Sukarno. Now, Suharto was no less a nationalist than his predecessor, but chose to assert Indonesian nationalism in a fundamentally different way. Post Suharto, Indonesia has yet to establish a stable new internal equilibrium. Indonesia is not just a geographic place. It is also, and more fundamentally, an idea. Since 1945, the idea of Indonesia has been contested. Will it be a secular nationalist idea or an Islamist nationalist idea? Indonesia's first two presidents, Sukarno and Suharto, suppressed the contest by force in favor of the former. After Suharto's fall, that contest is again the main axis of Indonesian politics. What the outcome will be, I do not know. But where Indonesia goes, ASEAN ultimately goes. No major power can hold ASEAN without holding Indonesia. Domestic politics will influence the details of Indonesia's future strategic alignments. But since nationalism of one variant or another is the common, is the common factor in the contest over the idea of Indonesia, domestic politics is unlikely to change its broad trajectory. 
Since the 1950s, Indonesia has accepted significant amounts of aid, trade, and investment from the West, from the Soviet Union, and from Maoist China, but ultimately has gone its own way, eluding all attempts at capture. Xi Jinping's China is learning the same lesson. To put things bluntly, China is learning that not everybody can be bought, that the bought do not always stay bought, and even the corrupt can be nationalist. Since the 19th century, nationalism has proven to be the most potent and enduring global force. It overcame empire, overcame communism, and a virulent ethnic nationalism of various kinds are now pressing hard against the civic nationalisms of many Western democracies. Nationalism will not be denied. Contemporary China is better understood as Han ethno-nationalism with socialist characteristics rather than socialism with Chinese characteristics. ASEAN is often compared, consciously or unconsciously, with the European Union. Until recently, when the EU's feet of clay were exposed, the comparison was not to ASEAN's advantage. The comparison is false, although the essential issue both organizations were intended to address is similar. After Bismarck united Germany in 1871, a fundamental imbalance arose in the heart of Europe. It took millions of deaths caused by two world wars and a holocaust before Europe settled upon regionalism as a solution. It worked quite well initially. So after Germany was reunited in 1990 and imbalance re-emerged in a new form, deeper and more ambitious regionalism through the EU, union and community through the pooling of sovereignties seemed the solution. But this was a step far too far. Unlike its predecessors, the EU is based on a fundamental internal contradiction, a supposedly post-nationalist community based on fears of a superior German nationalism. It is a construct that denies a basic human instinct, the need for identity of which national identity is a core and enduring component. Many of the problems with which the EU is now struggling stem from these internal contradictions. I do not think these contradictions can be resolved. No political solution that defies human nature can work any more than can an engineering solution that defies the laws of physics ever work. Until Europe recognizes reality and aligns its ambitions with human nature, it will lurch from crisis to crisis, never quite realizing its potential. ASEAN has done better. Indonesia's size posed as potentially a destabilizing fact imbalance in the heart of Southeast Asia, as Germany did in Europe. Perhaps because as modest Asians, we are less sentimoniously stubborn about our ideas. Unlike Europe, we did not have to wade through rivers of blood to deal, the, deal with this potentially catastrophic issue. It only took a minor undeclared war and a few failed experiments for us to find a solution that has stabilized Southeast Asia. Our solution, however, was not based on a futile attempt to deny human nature. It did not require the suppression of nationalism. It did not require Indonesian or any other nationalism to subordinate itself to another nationalism, to some supranational ideal. We may talk about community in ASEAN, but we don't really mean it, or we don't mean what the Europeans mean when they use the word. The C in our community is in political lowercase. Rather, ASEAN harnessed nationalism by appealing to the value that all nationalists, whatever their other animosities, hold in common when confronted with the nationalisms of bigger and more powerful states. And that value is autonomy. The problem that ASEAN was designed to manage was not the intrastate and interstate conflicts managed in, mentioned in the United States Institute of Peace paper by, or by other critics of ASEAN. Not every, not every problem has or requires a solution. To attempt to find solutions to some problems may only create worse new problems. The only problem to which finding a solution was an imperative was how to maintain autonomy in the midst of great power rivalries. This is what holds ASEAN together. ASEAN's essential premise was pithily summarized by an Indonesian slogan whose basic point was essentially similar to Mr. Rajaranam's idea of the regional interest being part of the national interest. And that slogan is, national resilience enhances regional resilience and regional resilience enhances national resilience. Regionalism based on nationalism is a theoretical contradiction in terms, 
but it works in practice. It is often messy. It sometimes operates by disregarding our own stated principles and procedures. It often results in suboptimal outcomes and its ambitions are limited. But it has proven enduring for precisely these reasons. Now, we cannot predict the future, but if we do not lose sight of the fundamentals that I have talked about for a bit too long, I would bet on ASEAN surviving the present phase of great power rivalry well beyond 2030. Thank you all for your patience in listening to me. Great, and thank you for, uh, as always, a fascinating discussion. Um, uh, of course, I'll just remind everybody that uh, the Q&A is open. It's down at the bottom of your screen. As usual, just click in and uh, type in your questions. And if you see any questions you like, please vote on them and send them to the top of the pile. Um, we already do have a couple of questions. Uh, it seems that people are interested in um, the relationship between Australia and ASEAN. Um, and how ASEAN might view uh, current developments in Australia, particularly Australia's relationship uh, with China. Um, as I'm sure you are aware, there's a, a tightening of relations uh, around uh, China with, uh, with, with more critical voices coming to the fore about the Australia-China relationship. Um, how does ASEAN, or how do actors in the region, I guess, um, view current tensions between Australia and China? if they do at all, and what can be done about it? That's a question from Andrew Farron. Do I answer it, or you, you want to take a few questions first? Uh, sure, I'll take another one which is uh, related to it. There's a question here from M Michael Fay um, about the constructive role that um, Australia can play in ASEAN. He asks, what role and influence can Australia play as an ASEAN plus six dialogue partner? Okay, let me start with the Australian-China -Chi relationship. Right? To my mind, you went from a position of extreme complacency to a somewhat overreaction, where almost every Chinese person, every ethnic Chinese is uh, perhaps viewed with a slight tinge of suspicion. You will eventually find an equilibrium, and there is an equilibrium to be found. There's another equilibrium. I think that you, I know there's some debate in Australia about this. You are quite dependent on China as a market for many of your resources. Well, many of us are dependent on China for a market, but just bear in mind that China does not buy your stuff because it likes your face. It buys your stuff or as a favor to you, it buys your stuff because your stuff is, the quality is good, the price is right. So balance is, is possible. It is possible to stand up to China and get along with China at the same time. Australia and ASEAN, well, I think both of us have changed our attitudes with, towards each other over time. It was not at one time, quite long ago, a very easy relationship, but it has become, I think, one of the closest relationships we have with our dialogue partners. You are not so big as to appear threatening, but you're big enough to be helpful. You have capabilities that many of the ASEAN countries need, uh, and, and you are willing to share them with them. That is a good thing. I can only see uh, the only other country, the only other dialogue partner which is in the same position is Japan. And Japan and Australia have a good relationship. So you can work with ASEAN, you can work with Japan and ASEAN. There is a lot that can be done. And I think the trajectory of ASEAN-Australia relationship is a very positive one now. Great. Um, okay, there are two questions here uh, related to Myanmar. Um, I'll ask uh, Zara Kimpton's one. Zara is our national vice president. Hello, Zara. How are you? Um, she asks, is ASEAN able to play any role in finding a solution to the Rohingya situation in Myanmar, or does the requirement for consensus make this impossible? Um, another one from Jay Collins uh, uh, is uh, somewhat more uh, cynical, I guess. There are human rights issues across Southeast Asia, particularly with Myanmar's uh, current current uh, genocide, it says. If um, ASEAN can't address this on a united front, then what other mechanisms are there that Southeast Asian countries will respond to? Well, it seems like I've been wasting my breath giving my lecture because I thought I explained quite well why there are limits to what ASEAN can do. <laughs> 
uh, and why the principle of consensus making and its corollary, non-interference, uh, cannot be compromised. We can be modified in practice, and we have modified it in practice. We have been discussing the situation in Myanmar, not just with regard to the Rohingya issue, when it was a military government, and when there were you know, periodic uh, suppressions of uh, in Myanmar, for many years. We have discussed the situation in East Timor when there was things going on there. Uh, but you know, the two questions lead me to, um, to uh, a good illustration of why ASEAN cannot be understood except on its own terms. You are trying to, to you are trying to criticize a horse for being a, uh, a cow for being an imperfect horse. Now that doesn't mean we cannot do any nothing, because we have built up confidence. We have been able to do some humanitarian work in in uh, Myanmar with the Rohingya, for example. But anything more will be just a risk too much to the organization as a whole. Uh, so I think you either take it or you leave it. Are you better off with ASEAN as it is or without ASEAN? These are ultimately the choices be between the UF. We are not in the sanctimonious business of commenting, criticizing, and so on each other. We try to help each other when we can, we try to ameliorate situations when we can. But who is going to solve the Rohingya issue? Only the Myanmar can solve it. What are we going to do? You expect us to put together a joint ASEAN strike force, invade, uh, overthrow the government, stabilize the situation in Rahin State? Rubbish. Get real, grow up. Okay, uh, fantastic. All right, we have a question here from um, Greta who asks, as you have stated, Indonesia is pivotal to ASEAN. What red lines should Beijing not cross in its relations with Jakarta? And can Indonesia exert more leadership on South China Sea issues? Well, put it this way. I think Beijing has great liabilities in its relationship with Indonesia. I'm beginning to think that China has some fundamental misunderstandings on Southeast Asia. And there are two in, in particular which I want to highlight, which are particularly pertinent to, pertinent to Indonesia. One is the role of the overseas Chinese. The role of the overseas Chinese is always a sensitive issue in Southeast Asia, and particularly so in Indonesia, where you may not have forgotten, not too long ago, 1998. That's not very long ago, huh? There, are, there were uh, serious anti-Chinese riots in Jakarta. Now, under Xi Jinping, Chinese policy, Chinese foreign policy has emphasized to a degree we have not seen a very long, for a very long time, relations with the overseas Chinese. This is not a very wise policy. Uh, why they do it, I leave it to you to speculate. But they have done all kinds of strange things. They have, for example, merged, put the overseas Chinese work uh, affairs office under the direct control of the United Front Work Office. That is a silly thing to do. It has been noticed in Jakarta as it has been noticed throughout Southeast Asia, and it has raised some eyebrows. The other issue is the Yuga issue. Uh, the government of Indonesia, as many other governments of Muslim majority countries, have not made a particular fuss about it, although it did become something of a, it did surface as a small issue in the presidential election, the last presidential election. But just because people don't want to make a fuss doesn't mean people don't notice. And I think the Indonesian people have noticed. And political Islam is playing a bigger role in Indonesia. And this thing is a problem waiting to happen. Mao Zedong once said, a single spark can light a prairie fire. Well, the way the Yugas have been treated is a potential prairie fire throughout the entire Muslim world. If you recall the Danish cartoon issue, or even the Salman Rushdie issue some years ago, no Muslim government wanted to make a fuss. But suddenly, out of nowhere, there are people there was a fatwa by some, by some Iranian cleric, and then the, and, and the thing just caught fire and took off. So 
These are things that Beijing should bear in mind in its relationship with Indonesia and indeed with Southeast Asia as a whole. But they are not doing so. I leave it to you to speculate why. All right, I'm going to ask a question. Now, you touched on this briefly in your, your talk, but you've written um, more extensively uh, about the Mekong situation. Um, and um, I'd like to know, um, in, in a recent article, you seem to be suggesting that there were patterns of cooperation in the South China Sea that could be... Um, replicated and applied to the Mekong situation. Um, I'm just wondering if you could flesh that out a little bit. What, what um, should ASEAN's role be um, in uh, ameliorating some of those dependencies that, that exist on, on the, the mainland ASEAN states? Okay, there are two aspects to the Mekong issues. I don't want to go into a lot of details because we'll take up all the time, right? One is issues between ASEAN Mekong riparian states, All right? Uh, China is not the only one indulging in uh, orgies of dam building, you know? I mean, Mekong riparian states are building their own dams on tributaries of the Mekong, and that has an impact too. And it hasn't been handled by the existing sub-regional organizations, the Mekong, very well. The, the kind of role that uh, ASEAN plays in, as I explained, ameliorating tensions between its members, has, ASEAN has not played the same kind of role with regard to Mekong issues. In fact, ASEAN, to my mind, to my certain not, my knowledge, my personal knowledge, has only briefly heard mention, I wouldn't even say discuss, heard mention of two ASEAN countries, Cambodia and Laos, discussing their problems over the Mekong once. Right? So that was some years ago. Maybe they have done, that's when I was still attending us and meeting. So first of all, you have to come to some kind of consensus, not to solve these problems, but to manage them between ASEAN countries. With that in hand, then you can try to have a talk with China. China always prefers to deal with issues bilaterally. China plus this, China plus that, China, for obvious reasons. I was asked something like this question um, just a couple of days ago when I gave a talk to a Cambodian uh, think tank, uh, and I was asked how should Cambodia deal with China on the Mekong issue. And I will give you the say. I'll tell you what I I answered because I think it's relevant. I say first of all, this is quite an existential issue to Cambodia. For two years in a row, Ton Lek Sap has not reversed its flow, and that has tremendous implications on agriculture, on fisheries, on a lot of things the livelihoods of millions of people are at stake. So it is quite an existential issue. It can become an existential issue. Now, you can't deal with the existential issue only on the basis of bilateralism. Because that is, you are a small country up against a very big country. It is in your interest to broaden the conversation, to get ASEAN involved, as it is as a whole involved in the South China Sea, and to get a broader international community involved. There are, I think, 17 countries in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Central Asia with, who, whose main rivers originate in China. And they all have similar concerns. But they don't know about each other's issues. Although the broad contours of the issues are very similar. There is a UN convention on the law of the non-navigable uses of international water courses. Only one Mekong, ASEAN Mekong riparian state is party to it, Vietnam. Why? I asked the Cambodians, I don't understand why the other riparian states do not see in the interest to accede to this thing. You believe, generally speaking, in a rules-based order for the sea. Why don't you want a rules-based order for the river? <laughs> Now, I think they will come to that. As I mentioned in my talk, you know, um, and Cambodia had to suspend at least two dams, two dam projects of their own. Why? Because of their own people were protesting. Uh, it, it takes time to change people's mindset. As Mr. Rajaram said, you need a new way of thinking to see the regional interest as part of your national interest. But I think these pressures will bring them there. Uh, it will also change Chinese behavior, possibly. 
at least very recently, China announced that they will share hydrographic uh, data, data about water flows in the upper reaches of the Mekong with everybody. Well, let's see. Okay, great. Um, we have uh, a question that I guess is on a lot of people's mind at the moment about um, um, about US-China rivalry and the outcome of the US election. Do you think that, uh, I mean, that's not a, not a question about ASEAN per se, but how is ASEAN viewing um, the, the upcoming election in the United States? Do you think that the... Um, that the rivalry between China and the United States is now structural and unavoidable, or uh, is, uh, is, is there likelihood that US-China rivalry will, will subside pending the outcome of the election? Well, I think, well, I, I can't claim to know what ASEAN as a whole is thinking, but I think I know what some ASEAN, uh, some, some people in some ASEAN countries are thinking, and I'll try to summarize their views. I think this is, first of all, a new structural reality of, of uh, international relations, not just in our region, but more generally. There will be, of course, periods of high tension, periods of lower tension, and it will, does not mean that uh, cooperation is entirely ruled out, but rivalry is going to main the main team. So we better learn to live with it. You'll probably get more tense as the as as the uh, election draws near. But I think we have to understand this, these are structural features. Uh, there is a bipartisan consensus in the United States on certain aspects of Chinese behavior. In fact, there's a global consensus among the advanced economies about, of concern on certain aspects of Chinese behavior. So this is not just about Trump, this is not just about the US. I don't know what the outcome of the uh, election will be. I would don't yet take it for granted, as many commentators seem to do, that uh, Mr. Biden will beat Mr. Trump. I think it's still an open question to my mind. But that's not going to change fun things fundamentally. I think, I doubt Mr. Biden is going to dismantle, say, the, the restrictions on the export of technology uh, that the Trump administration put into place because they share some of the same concerns. I doubt the Biden administration is going to entirely undo or change fundamentally the approach on trade because they share some of the same concerns. In fact, those concerns are widely shared throughout the globe. What may happen in a Biden administration, at least I hope will happen if there is a Biden administration, is a more orderly decision-making process and a more traditional communication process of American policy. And that will all be to the good. Uh, but that doesn't fundamentally change the trajectory. And there is a risk. Don't, it's not as if, a, if, that, if Mr. Biden is elected, you know, milk and honey follows, huh? all problems are solved. They won't be solved. As I said, it's a structural problem. And there is some risk of Mr. Biden being pulled into different directions and his policy descending into incoherence for a different reason. So let's wait and see. But I don't, think, I don't think anybody should hold their breath and hope for a fundamental change of approach, a fundamental change in US-China relations. It could be somewhat calmer, but there will be tension. It will be fundamentally the same policy, but with a more orderly implementation and communication policy. That's what I expect and hope for. But even that, I'm not sure because I'm not sure Mr. Biden is going to win. Okay, very good. Um, there's a question here about India. Now, a couple of years back, uh, Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, um, gave a speech at the Shangri-La Dialogue in uh, Singapore, actually, and, um, and uh, laid out his Indo-Pacific vision and uh, made um, a lot of the notion that, that India's Indo-Pacific vision was really focused on ASEAN, obeisance to ASEAN centrality, if you like. Um, uh, there's a question here about, uh, given, given the, the, the talk about uh, ASEAN centrality and India's foreign policy, um, do you see, or can you comment on a possible role for India in relation to ASEAN? What are the, how is the relationship developing there? Okay, I think 
we have to manage expectations. I think India has an important role to play, and I think I can say that after the decade-long estrangement between ASEAN and India over the Cambodian issue, Singapore played a leading role in bringing back India into ASEAN, the ASEAN fold. Uh, but India is India. It will move at its own pace. It is a vast and complicated country, far more complicated than China. And therefore, its strategic energies are always going to be primarily inward directed and secondarily westward directed towards Pakistan and only thirdly look east. <laughs> Uh, things take a long time to get done in India because of the complexity of society, the complexity of its politics, and don't forget it's a democracy, unlike uh, China. So things are, are moving, but they are moving quite slowly. Right? Uh, but India is a big country, it's an ancient country, it's a proud country, and it is also a big country that is contiguous to Southeast Asia. We forget that, right? Uh, so it will play a role in time. And India moves at its own pace. It's probably going to be slower than anybody likes, and it may be now a bit slower because of the after effects, which are, I mean, the pandemic is still a very serious situation in India, right? And that will have enormous economic and other consequences. So it will be a bit more distracted than usual for a long time. But India is there. It's a permanent reality. It can only get larger and larger a reality in Southeast Asia as time goes by. And I think on the whole, that's a, that's a good thing. That's a very good thing, but we will have to be patient. Okay, very good. Well, we're um, coming, we're brushing up against the hour now. So um, I want to take this opportunity with the time that we have left to thank you for uh, what was a, an extremely insightful uh, presentation. And um, thank you for answering the questions. Now, our Tasmanian branch tells us that you were due down in Tasmania before COVID, but uh, things had to be cancelled. But yeah. we hope to see you down here at some stage uh, soon. And if you do, please come, come by one of our uh, branches. Oh, definitely. I'm mean, getting restless not being able to travel. You know, everything else is I can live with, you know. But, <laughs> but two things, the bars being closed and not being able to travel is really getting on my nerves. So I hope to see you all in person before too long. Well, the bars are open down here, so I'll, I'll buy you a beer if you make it to Canberra. <laughs> make it a scotch. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you very much again. And I'd like to thank our, um, our communications assistant, Phoebe Humphreys, for pressing the buttons. She probably thinks I'm a boomer for not being able to do it myself. <laughs> and um, I'd like to thank you, the audience. Uh, do stick around because we um, have a, our usual presentation of what's coming up. So take it away, Phoebe. And Bye. goodbye, everyone.